the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. There was a woman afflicted with hemorrhages for 12 years. She had suffered greatly at the hands of many doctors and had spent all that she had. Yet she was not helped, but only grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. She said, if I but touch his clothes, I shall be cured. Immediately her flow of blood dried up. She felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. Jesus, aware at once that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and asked, Who has touched my clothes? But his disciples said to him, You see how the crowd is pressing upon you, and yet you asked who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. The woman, realizing what had happened to her, approached in fear and trembling. She fell down before Jesus and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has saved you. Go in peace and be cured of your affliction. God our Father, as we continue to come close to the celebration of the Easter sacraments, we ask that uh, your beloved children that are preparing to receive these sacraments be that these be truly a time of encounter, uh, especially through the reception of uh, of these sacraments, that you will be able to reveal your great love for them and draw them ever closer to you. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. We will come back to that passage, and we'll see why I chose that for today. Um, we could probably close the blinds if you guys are being blinded. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, wait, which one do I do now? Oh, oh, sunlight's nice, but... All right. So... We have been going through the theology of the body, just to remind us of what we've been doing. And we've been going through in that context, using the theology of the body to help try to understand many of the different teachings the church has in the area of sexuality, right? And we've been going quite a bit of detail into this because these tend to be the big things that come up culturally and some of the ways in which the Catholic Church is a bit different in her theology, even compared with other Christian um, uh, other Christian denominations. Um, some Christian denominations have gone the way of the world and basically adhered to what the world, the way the world wants to go in that. Whereas the Catholic Church, we stand strong in what the tradition based upon Jesus' teachings, but many people just don't understand. Even Catholics will sometimes reject some of these um, for various reasons. Um, so we looked at how over time um, when when we, when we try to change what God has created, when we try to make the one flesh union within marriage, when we try to turn it into something else, that one thing builds upon another, that many of these have been related, that when you break down what God's original plan is, then the next one really seems to follow culturally from, from the other. And so you get, you'll get individuals who will be absolutely against abortion, but they very strongly feel that contraception is okay. But the reality is, is that that's inconsistent logically and in reality, because if you're okay with contraception, then you really should be okay with abortion. If, you're, if you realize that abortion is killing an unborn human being, you really ought to also be against contraception. Similar thing with IV, uh, with in vitro fertilization, the, the, the similarities and connections. So what we're going to be looking at today now is how this kind of, this breakdown of God's original vision for who we are as men and women and what married, marriage is all about has, has led, ne leads next to um, the, the promotion of same-sex relations. So once you've removed the permanence from marriage, from the, uh, from the unitive, now you can begin to kind of break down what into some it, marriage into something else. Um, contraception removed procreation from sex and marriage. Um, abortion is used as a backup when contraception fails. IVF and surrogacy then removes the union from the procreation. And now same-sex relation removes procreation from the need of biological complementarity in the sexual act. Right. So if you if you've so you you remove that 
sex has anything to do at all with the production of children, well then why can't, you know, same sex why 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 not same sex relations? Right? It's really where the world goes. So we're going to we're going to investigate this next is same sex attraction. What does the church what does the Catholic Church teach in this area? Because some people um well I think many people are aware what the church teaches, though some people also think that she's kind of changed her teaching. Uh, they'll go back, actually, this happened uh, 10 years ago now. Uh, Pope Francis, um, some people are like, well, didn't Pope Francis say it's okay? Uh, because they'll always quote him as saying, if somebody is gay and he searches for the Lord and has goodwill, who am I to judge? Right? Have you heard that? Who am I to judge? That became very much popularized after he said that. And so some people interpret that to mean that's like the Pope, the church is okay with it um, until they actually find out that it's like, no, the church hasn't changed her teaching and neither has Pope Francis. Um, so if we go back 10 years and look at what was the context in which he, he gave this. So the context was in a press conference. Uh, he, 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 from the very beginning of his pont pontificate, he, he uh, had the habit of doing these kind of impromptu uh, in-flight press conferences when he was headed between various um, journeys that he was doing. And so on this one, particularly in 2013, here's the context of the quote. He says, if someone is gay, gay and is searching for the Lord and has good will, then who am I to judge? And then he quotes the catechism of the Catholic Church. So in other words, I mean, he intends to be in line with what the catechism says. The catechism explains in a beautiful way, saying, wait a moment, how does it say? He's trying to remember you know, what it actually says. Um, it says no one should marginalize these people for this. They must be integrated in society. It's not. We'll see here. It's not exactly a precise quote, because he's doesn't have it memorized. Right. The problem is not having this tendency. No, we must be brothers and sisters to one another. Right. So he's pointing out to a a a, a portion of the catechism. So if we look at the catechism and see what the context is that he's trying to quote, uh, because it's not exactly that. This is what he's trying to quote. It's paragraph twenty three fifty eight. Um, which speaks about those who have deep-seated homosexual tendencies. So it points out, the church points out that we don't deny that those, that, that exists, right? We know that there are people who are, who experience that kind, those kinds of attractions. It says this inclination, which is objectively disordered, and we'll come back, we'll talk about that, constitutes for most of them a trial. They must be accepted with respect, compassion, and sensitivity. Every sign of unjust discrimination in their regard should be avoided, right? So that's the portion that he's trying to remember, which he doesn't really quote word for word, but the same idea is, is there, right? Is that the, the, and this is in response culturally to, you know, perhaps those forces at different times which would persecute people who experience those kinds of attra attractions, but, and then it continues, these persons are called to fulfill God's will in their lives, and if they're Christians, to unite the sacrifice of the Lord's cross, the difficulties they may encounter from their condition, right? So what we're going to find is that the church doesn't single those who experience same-sex attraction out as being, like, uniquely objectively disordered, <laughs> but that we're all called, every single person, just like any of us, are called to unite whatever trials we go through in our life and, try, and strive to grow in holiness in union with Jesus, right? So that's that's the greater context of that. I um, also want to point out, too, this isn't the only thing the Catechism says, um, that the this is the paragraph right before it. Homosexuality refers to relations between men and women who experience an exclusive predominant sexual attraction toward persons of the same sex. It's taken a great variety of forms in different centuries and different cultures. Its psychological genesis remains largely unexplained basing itself on sacred scripture, which presents homosexual acts as acts of grave depravity. Tradition has always declared that homosexual acts are intrinsically disordered, right? So there's that term again, intrinsically disordered or, or objectively disordered. So we're gonna have to talk about what that means. So they're contrary to natural law. Uh, they close the sexual act to the gift of life. They do not proceed from a genuine effect affective and sexual complementarity, and under no circumstances can they be approved, right? So this is pretty clear um, what the church says with regard to um, same-sex actions, right? So let's, let's clarify a little bit more here as well. So this term objectively disordered. So to be disordered objectively is to mean something is not ordered for what it is made for. 
right? Things are ordered a specific way. We've talked about this, the way God has made us. He's made us a specific way. When we talked about the language of the body, right? Uh, the language of sex speaks a certain language. It speaks a thing. And if we act according to the way that God has created it, we're, we're ordered properly. But if we act in a way that's contrary to the way God has created us, then we're acting disorderly. So this can this going to be, we can use this term not only with regard to same-sex attraction or actions, but we can also apply it to anything in our life, right? You know, any choice you make, am I making an ordered or disordered choice, right? A thought that we might have. Is this an ordered thought or a disordered thought, right? So same with regard to the church, same-sex attraction. So does the church, is the attraction itself ordered or dis, is it disordered? based upon what you would, what we saw there. What do you think? Is the attraction itself disordered? Yes, it is. That's what the, that's what the catechism says. Yes. So then are the actions then, right? So you may be attracted, so let's say individuals attracted to someone of the same sex, that very attraction isn't ordered properly. Um, is the action, so to engage and follow through with those attractions, would that be disordered? Yes, because if the attraction is, then the then carrying it out would also be disordered. Here's the question. Is same-sex attraction a sin? No. It's not a sin. But to act upon it is. And this is the same for any other kind of disordered thought we might have in our mind, right? So, for example, let's say someone has the disordered thought of, I really want that thing that belongs to somebody else, so I, I want to take it, right? That thought that they have of stealing something else, somebody else's property, that thought is disordered, right? It is not ordered properly, right? It's contrary to God's law. It's disordered. But it's not yet a sin. It's a temptation, right? If they steal it, then it's a sin, right? So this is the same way. So the way the church handles same-sex attraction and same-sex actions is just like any other sin, right? So well, that's one of the important things is that the, the church doesn't see those who struggle with same-sex attraction as being like uniquely disordered worse than other people. All of us have our disorders. Selfishness is a disorder. <laughs> so if we act out of selfishness, we're disordered. Every time we sin, we're acting disordered. Right? We're not acting toward the end, toward the purpose that God's created us, right? And so this is, this, is, this is actually beautiful and good news. When the church says that they're disordered, it may sound like, oh, you're calling me disordered. Well, yeah, because we all are. <laughs> We're all messed up in need of Jesus, right? We're all disordered in some way or the other. It's just that they're not, they're not uniquely disordered. It's just that people have denied that the attraction and actions are indeed not ordered properly. And so the church has to explain that, no, it's not ordered properly. Right? We don't have to say, you know, to desire to murder someone is disordered. I mean, the church does say that it, <laughs> that it is, but that's more obvious to people, right? That that's not, there's something wrong there if you're desiring to murder somebody, right? So I'm not equating those two, right? It's to have a same-sex attraction is not the same as to want to murder somebody that's, or, or, or committing the sins are not the same either. But, uh, but yeah, so the church doesn't. The problem isn't that people that there are people that exist that struggle struggle with that attraction, um, because we all have distortions of our human nature that we struggle with, right? The effects of original sin are where are where are the origin of this. Um, let's give a little bit more of his context of his quote. So he also so he was asked about those who are lobbying for a gay lifestyle, basically political lobbying for, for this. Uh, when you spoke about the gay lobby, I believe that when you're dealing with such a person, you must distinguish between the fact of a person being gay and the fact of someone forming a lobby because not all lobbies are good. This one is not good. And then he gives the quote in there saying that, but if somebody is seeking the Lord, you know, who am I to judge them, right? The problem is not having this tendency no, we must be brothers and sisters to one another. Problem is making a lobby of this tendency, right? So he's not saying j someone could be tempted or or have this inclination that they're struggling with, just like we all have our specific things that we struggle with, and that's not that's okay, right? And he says, I'm not judging a person if they're trying to follow the Lord. Then we don't judge each other, right? Just based upon that happens to be your struggle, 
right? That's what he's saying. But he's saying there is a problem when you have a movement that tries to say, let's make this good, right? Let's make what is not good, good, right? So that's what he's distinguishing between. Between the individuals who happen to experience same-sex attraction, but they're also trying to follow God, they want to do his will, versus those who are trying to push that lifestyle um, and advocate for it and advertise it and make kid shows and, you know, all those kinds of things we see in our culture today with regard to these kinds of things. That is not good. That's what he's saying. So now we can see a little bit better. What we often don't see is, I mean, when you get little news blurbs, I mean, they're not going to quote the whole thing that he actually says in here. So so in this kind of context, we can also think about, so what what happens with regard to this kind of, this kind of promotion of, same sex. Oh, and uh, well, we'll get to that here in a second. What, why? My, I, I've, it's a very specific choice of words when I talk about this. I talk about same sex attraction rather than talking about gay, lesbian, that. Same, and we'll get to that here in a second. But it's related to this right here. It, it, so there is a phenomenon as part of this culturally where people are encouraged to come out with what their sexuality is all about, right? So they disclose to others what their orientation, what their sexual identity is, right? To complete strangers online, through social media, all sorts of different ways that they do it, right? And that's seen as being heroic today and all that, right? Um, so if we, if we take a step back from like the political or the cultural nature of it and just go to the individual, right? Interiorly, what's going on with somebody who feels drawn to go in that way? Well, they're trying to understand who they are, right? Just as we all try to understand who we are, right? Trying to understand what's going on within. What are these desires that I have? And, and sexual desires that a person experiences are very, very strong. I mean, they're, they're an important part of who a person is. And, and so they're trying to understand and figure that out. Um, and oftentimes these desires can arise without directly choosing them, right? They may not choose to say, I don't, I, some will express and say, I didn't choose to be attracted this way, right? But we also have a desire to want to be accepted by others, other people, right? We want people to know and love us for who we are, right? And so that's also what they're trying to do. By, by proclaiming, this is who I am, tr they want other people to accept and love them. And also to get rid of any feelings of, like, I'm not like other people, um, to get rid of that shame that could potentially be there, right? Um, but the problem that arises then, especially with the promotion in the world around us, is to tell them that they should define the core of their identity based upon their experiences of sexual attraction and, and behavior, right? That that's what defines you. That's what makes your complete identity. That's who you fundamentally are, right? And so that's why I don't use labels like gay, lesbian, bisexual, and the, the plethora of labels that people give to each other today to give themselves an identity because they are making their identity based upon that one experience, just that one part of who they are, right? Um, and what it does too is it also helps them feel like they're belonging to a community, right? Because we can't live alone, right? And so there is a group, there's a lobby that has formed, there's a community there, you know, LGBT community, and so they feel like they're a part of someone, right? They feel like, now I am somebody. Because prior to that, I mean, it could have even been the case in which they were shunned by those closest to them because of the experience of this, right? And so they're really searching to be loved and to, and to belong, but the world around them tells them to do it the, a way in which that doesn't fit with the Christian understanding, right? Because it's, it's, if you, you don't want to take an experience that is disordered and use it as your identity, right? I mean, we, someone who may struggle with lying, you know, you know, you don't have to form your identity and say, I am a liar, you know, <laughs> someone who struggles with, you know, um, overeating or something, I don't know, <laughs> you know, that's, I mean, I am gluttonous or, I mean, we can no recognize our sins but it's a similar. It would be like it would be like, for example, you know, telling a child, you know, you are a bad child. Well, no, you're a good. 
you're a good child who does bad things sometimes. You're not a bad child, you know. So, but this is what's going on, is they're forming their identity in something that doesn't fully describe who they are and ultimately isn't ordered properly. And so that's why I actually read the, the reading that we started with the woman with the hemorrhages. Because this can kind of this can kind of see teach us how Jesus addresses those who have formed an identity by the world around them that isn't necessarily good for understanding the deepest part of who they are, right? So if we think about this woman who's been afflicted for 12 years, it says, with hemorrhages, and this was a major illness, therefore, in her life, right? And in fact, it made her ritually impure. She was not allowed to go to the women's court at the temple to be able to worship with everybody else. It excluded her from that, right? She was being excluded from the community, you know, in much, in much the same way as many people feel they're excluded from any kind of community um, because they're experiencing certain things in their life. She didn't necessarily choose this, right? This, this arose, you know, this illness arose within her. But everyone else considers her an impure woman, right? That's who she is. That's what the culture around her has just told her. This is your identity. You are an impure woman, right? Similar thing with what's happening to people in the area of sexuality. This is your identity, you know, and they receive it, and that's what their identity is. But we need to look at this passage. What does Jesus do, right? He does not call her an impure woman, right? He knows what her true identity is, right? And that's what he's going to do. When he encounters her, he is going to give her her identity back, right? So what does he say to her? Daughter, your faith has saved you. Go in peace and be cured of your affliction, right? Because what is her identity? She is a beloved daughter of God, right? That is her core identity of who she is, right? And that's who we all are. We are God's beloved sons and daughters, right? That's what defines us at the core of our being, right? And that includes anybody who experiences same-sex attraction, right? That's not who, they may experience that, but that's not who they are. They're a son and daughter of God, right? That's what makes them, and that's why the church rejects these kinds of labels and, 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 and sees this kind of cultural push, I mean, as being so destructive because it's pushing at, at a false identity upon an identity that will never be able to fulfill and make them happy as to who they are. Um, our identity is that we are his, his beloved children. And there's some beautiful resources where you can actually um, see uh, individuals who have experienced same-sex attraction where they rediscover this, they find this. In fact, this is something that everyone needs to oftentimes rediscover. I mean, I can't tell you how many times, you know, in the confessional, somebody who has been away for a really long time and have gotten caught up in so many disordered things in their life, right, all this junk has been telling them, and the world around them has been telling them, this is who you are, right? And then they come back to the confessional, and I can give them their identity back, right? Those sins you've been caught in for years, that's not who you are. You're his beloved son. You're his beloved daughter, right? Receive your identity back, the identity that you lost because all these other things were telling you what you had to be, right? And, and so that's why, yeah, we, 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 we can't just go along with the culture because it, it doesn't, it, it, we're not going to claim that there's some, something other than who they are, right? We can only te tell, teach people, and, and you'll see this, is, this applies to very much so, I won't go into it as much when we get, go into transgender stuff, but it applies in the same way, right, as to why it's so destructive. People are lost and they don't know who they are, and so they, they try to cling to cling to a certain community and identity because they've lost the fact that they're a child loved by God. Right. So I can go into a lot more. Uh, a couple resources, too. So there's a Catholic organization called Courage. Um, that's a really good. It helps those that are struggle with same-sex attraction as well as families who may have somebody who struggles with same-sex attraction to help them understand these kinds of things and why, in a deeper way, I didn't really go through a lot of details of this. Oh, we could we could also apply the language of the body or and and the the free, total, faithful, fruitful love. So if you think about same uh, same sex relations, what's missing there? Free, total, faithful, fruitful. Yeah, at least the fruitful part, right? Because they just simply can't. There is no 
new life cannot physically come from that. <laughs> um, so, and if it doesn't model, if it's not modeled after the love of God, then it's going to be a false kind of of, of love. Um, so I could go into that more. We will go into a little bit more because related to this, related to same-sex relations, is the next step that the culture takes after saying nor, trying to normalize that is same-sex marriage. And I put it in quotes because following Catholic theology is not marriage. Um, so if you can remove the procre if you can remove procreation and, and biological complementary from sex, well then why not remove it from marriage too? Right? So let's look at same sex marriage. So we found that this was this uh, was became the the law of the land through the Obergefell versus Hodges Supreme Court case in 2015. It's already been eight years already. So it's been a while already. That gave same-sex couples the legal right to a marriage. In a 5-4 decision, all 50 states are now required to perform and recognize marriages of same-sex couples on the same terms and conditions of the marriages of opposite-sex couples with all the accompanying rights and responsibilities. Right, so that's what's required by law now. Um, interestingly, so if you actually read the decision, um, it's it gives it gives a it, here's here's one of the comments that it makes as to why we need to allow it. Well, I mean, there's some other, you can, the, the reasons of why you have to is very kind of like, it's very circular when you actually read it. They basically, they list four major reasons, but they're not really arguments. They're just kind of statements. Some people have chose this, therefore we have to allow it. It's kind of how their argument goes, which is not really an argument. But anyway, the, I, I find this is, this, this, this comment here really reveals something. To us, their hope is not to be condemned to live in loneliness, excluded from the one of civilization's oldest institutions. They ask for equal dignity in the eyes of the law, right? The dignity part, right? They're saying that if you don't let us have marriage in the same way that opposite sex couples have, you've taken away our dignity, right? Do you see how their identity is so, and their dignity is so caught up in? their experience of their, their, their sexual attractions, that their dignity is in there, right? But it's like, just because someone isn't married doesn't mean they have less dignity, right? Like, I can't get married. Doesn't mean I have less dignity. There's plenty of people that are too young to get married. Doesn't mean they have less dignity. You know, there, there are people who've lost a spouse. They're not married anymore. Doesn't mean they have less dignity now. You know, but, uh, but, but, they equate this with, I mean, the catchphrase then, I don't know if it's used as much now, I, but uh, was that love wins, right? Love is one. But it depends upon what you mean by love, right? Um, going back into uh, the Greek language and Greek philosophy, there were four words for love. Storge, which is a, a kind of a natural affection or liking of something, so you might have storge toward your pet, you know. <laughs> Um, philia is a friendship kind of love, right? So we can have friendships with one another. Uh, eros is the sexual desire, and then agape is is self-sacrificial love. That's the love of God Himself, right? That's what Jesus taught and showed us, right? And so in this conclusion, when they say love wins, what they're really doing is they're restricting love to only one kind of love. They're saying all love is eros. In order to experience love, you must experience sexual desire. And if you're not allowed to experience the desire and act upon it in a way that is condoned and institutionalized, um, then you, you can't have love, right? But it's excluding all the other kinds of love from being love. So what it really ends up through it is that love becomes less through that decision. So love didn't win. It's become res more restricted as to what it really means. Right. Also, what it obscures too is it obscures the difference between the fact that, that sex doesn't equate intimacy between people. Um, first off, you, no one has ever died from not having sex. <laughs> but people have died from a lack of in intimacy. Um, 
there was a, there's a story going back I don't remember what century it was but uh, there's a, the there there a, a king had desired to do a an experiment who wanted to find out um, so if you take a if you take babies and you know he's like well babies learn language from their parents right so they they imitate their parents and they learn they learn to speak you know based upon what the what the parents are saying right so they just kind of learn through time over that and so his curiosity was like well well what if the baby never hears any language spoke to them. What will they will they develop a language? What language will they develop? You know, how will they learn? What will they learn to speak? So that's so the experiment was performed, in which a number of babies were raised by their nurses, but they were not allowed to say anything to the children, to the babies. So what do you think the result was? What kind of language did they did they come up with? Did they do? They never found out. They all died. They died from a lack of intimacy, of connection, of human connection, right? They, think they needed that, right? And so intimacy is this really deepest connections with one another. You could even break it apart. Into me see, right, is really what intimacy is. The other person sees and they know who I am, right, in a deeper way than anybody else. We can't live without that. But just having sex with someone doesn't mean it's intimate. <laughs> doesn't mean that they know who you are, right? In fact, that's why, you know, when people seek out sex without that intimacy, it never lasts and it leaves them unfulfilled because that's not really what they're looking for. They're not just looking for pleasure. We want to know and be known by another, right? And so, and that's what's that's what's missing here is that this is all about the sexual desire and fulfilling what I want, what can I get? But that's not what love is. Love is how can I do the good for the other? not just what I can fulfill for myself, right? But that's obscured in bringing forth and in, in changing what marriage is all about. We could, we could also look at Catholic theology in, in particular. So we talked about how marriage reveals God, right? It's made in his image. It reveals the Trinity, that love is communion, so that the Father, he gives his whole self to, his, to the Son, and the Son gives his whole self back to the Father, and the love between them is so real, it is the third person of the Holy Spirit. And then in the Trinity of the family, that's modeled after the God's Trinity. You know, the husband gives his whole self to his wife, and the wife gives her whole self back to him, and the love between them is so real that it can bring forth the life of another person, their children, right? And so that's what the church says, is that marriage is modeled after the very life of the Trinity itself. But what same-sex marriage does is it says, we're going to decide to say marriage is something else. And so what it does, it's a direct attack on our understanding of marriage as Christians. If we change what marriage is, we'd have to say that marriage does not reveal the love of the Trinity. Right? That's really what's at stake. If, as Christians, we would be okay with same-sex marriage, we would have to give this up and say that marriage is not in God's image. It doesn't image his love. Same thing, we also talked about how marriage is also modeled after the love between Jesus and the church, remember? Husband, wives are under the mission of their husband, and husband's mission is to love as Christ loves unto death. But if marriage isn't between the complementarity of men and women that represent Jesus and the church, well then, once again, we'd have to say that, sorry, marriage does not reveal the love of Jesus and the church. And as Catholics, we can't accept that, right? So the church cannot accept same-sex marriage because it undermines completely our, our, our theology of what marriage is all about. So, so that's from our theology point of view. But if, I mean, if you talk to people out in the world you know, as to why we shouldn't ha legalize same-sex marriage, they're not going to be impressed with that because they're like, well, quit forcing your religion on me. Right? <laughs> but we can speak of it in terms of just kind of natural law. And I think the easiest way to talk to people about it has to do with something we've talked about before that is connected to marriage, and that's children. Right. So we find we found already that that with regard to mar marriage and the, the wedding rite, I mean children are mentioned all all over the place in there because the union unitive of husband and wife and the procreative, the bringing forth a new life, are intimately connected in what marriage is all about. So we can look at what are some potential definitions of marriage. The world would say that marriage is just a public recognition of a committed relationship between a man and a woman or whoever 
to adults, though I'm like, well, if that's all it is, why does it have to be adults? And some people are questioning that even now, right? Uh, for their for, for for their fulfillment, right? Um, but people have questioned each of those things, right? Um, they want public recognition because they want others to recognize publicly that what they are doing and living is legitimate, right? Um, though there's some people who are like, well, we shouldn't include committed in there because what if I want an open marriage? Whatever that means, open marriage. It's once again, it's let's change marriage to something completely different, right? Yeah, why does that have to be two, right? Why not more than two? You know, there's some people who have tried advocating for that and they want that, right? So versus a, a nice kind of, in a sense, a non-religious sounding definition of marriage that anybody, you don't have to be, don't have to be Christian to, to understand is that marriage unites, what is marriage? Marriage unites a man and a woman to each other and to any children born of that union. That this could be a good working definition of how to talk to people with regard to why same-sex marriage is not good, right? So it unites a husband and a wife, and it unites moms and dads to their children, right? So let's kind of flesh that out. Um, so because if you notice, this one over here is all about what the adults want, right? It doesn't take into account anything about potential children. Whereas the other one does. It recognizes that with regard to marriage and family, the children are as much a part of this as the adults are. And we'll see that same-sex attraction and our same-sex marriage is really about what adults want, and they don't really take into account what children need. So here's the question for you. Does everybody have a mom and dad? What do you think? Yeah, everyone has a mom and dad. Biologically, it is impossible not to have both a mom and a dad because human life, life requires the genetic material from both the mother and the father, right? What about an orphan? Do they have a mom and a dad? Yeah, it's just that tragically they've been separated from their mom and dad, right? What about those who have parents who have died? Do they have a mom and a dad? Yes, they do. I mean, even if they don't believe that they're still alive in heaven, you know, they have had parents, otherwise they wouldn't even be here. What about a single parent? Does that child have both a mom and a dad? Mm -hmm. They do, it's just that one is not there, right, for whatever reason. What about those that are adopted by, some, by other parents? Do they have a mom and a dad? Yes, they certainly have their biological parents that, for whatever reason, may not be in their life, or maybe they're in their life in some way, but then they also have another set of, of a mother and a father to be their parents as well. What about those who are, whose parents are divorced? Do they have a mom and a dad? They do. It's just that now there's this, this separation there um, that, has, that has occurred. What about same-sex couples who have children? Do those children have a mom and a dad? They do, even if it is that they're living in a household that has two men or two women. Those children have a mom and a dad. What about those who were born via in vitro fertilization, surrogacy, egg and sperm donation, do they have a mom and a dad? Yes, they do. In, in no case is there a child who doesn't have a mom and a dad. But there are cases in which the child is not with their mom and dad. And so maybe now you can begin to see what I'm saying. In marriage unites a man and woman to each other and to the children that are born, right? This is what marriage is. The things that don't unite the mom and dad to their children, that is not marriage. Right? And that's what the institution, even from a secular level, that's what the institution of marriage is all about. It ensures that the mom and dad stay connected to each other and to their children. But things that don't do that are not marriage. Yes, so everybody has that. But there are cases in which parents are excluded by choice from their children. Right? So marriage is meant to make sure they stay united, but adults can make choices that purposely separate one or the other from their children. Right? And that's what happens through divorce. Right? It is a choice to separate themselves in some way, whether it's temporary at times. You know, um, and that's why Pope Francis will say that you know, there is a weight that crushes the soul of a child where family members hurt each other. And there's that, that struggle between them where they break the bonds of, their, their, of, of marriage. 
Uh, when they're thinking, he, there he says, when adults lose their head, when they're just thinking of themselves, right? It's all turned inward. Adults thinking about what they need, not thinking about what, what is the children need, that the children suffer terribly uh, in, in those, that there's wounds upon them. And this is the same thing that happens in same-sex marriage. Same-sex marriage purposefully excludes a parent from the child's life, right? One or both, depending upon how they go about it. Same thing with all these, these, these uh, fertility things that the church rejects as well, right? You're purposely excluding a parent or more, one or, or, one or both, from the child's life. Yeah. Could adoption be on that too? So adoption, the, why is adoption not good? Or why, or why is adoption okay by the church, right? Why is it not fit into the same way? Because adoption, something has happened not by choice, let's say. Let's say parents have died or, or, or let's say, you know, a woman chooses to have her child, let her child be adopted rather than abort her child, right? Because she's unable to care for the child, right? I mean, it is, it is better in a sense for a parent to be able to raise the, the best situation is for the mother and the father to be in the child's life, right? But if they cannot because of circumstances that we can't control, then it is better to so that they have a set of parents, a mother and a father. That's also why same-sex marriage shouldn't adopt because they cannot fulfill the need of a mother and a father, right? They may be really good at being parents, but two men cannot be a mom and a dad, right? Two women cannot be a a mother and a father to that child because they bring different things to them. They can't fulfill what the child needs, right? So the only ways that a same-sex couple can have that is through some kind of some kind of separation, uh, something that, that, that happens. Um, so there is no such thing as an intact family when it comes to same-sex marriage, right? So it is so it, so it can't so if marriage is the institution that ensures a mom and dad are united to themselves and to their children same sex you cannot call that marriage because it, by its very nature it separates the children from at least one of the parents right and and so even i don't have i'm not going to play some of these videos but uh but um i even have ones where you have individuals so that the woman here who who is speak, speaking that she actually had you know to mothers, to, uh, you know, she had same-sex parents, but she's absolutely against same-sex marriage because she recognizes that, that, that it, it's, not, it's not fulfilling the needs of the children. I mean, they may be okay with it because they're told to say they're okay with it, <laughs> you know, and they're like, yeah, well, of course we're okay. It's the only thing we've ever known. But deep down, like, what about the parent we're missing, right? Where are we with that? Do we ever miss that? Right. And if you think about it, too, is like if you're using something like surrogacy or something, you know, for a same sex um, couple come in, you know, they had, let's say it's two men that want to have a, a child. Right. And they can't. It's impossible for them to have a child on their own. So they get another woman. And in order to make their their household, they have to break the child away from the only relationship they've ever known between the mother that's carrying them. Right. And so they have to in order to bring it into their home. Right, and so by its very nature, it's 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 and it, it, it's it's about what adults want, and not what the children are about. Right, when really that should be the way, other way around. Right, the foundation of the lives of the children are based upon the parents, and um, so so I think that. Other things that come to my mind too. I I, I take I've taken this out of a lo much longer lesson that I go through, but we'll 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 stop there for that. Any other thoughts with regard to same sex attraction or marriage? Does those things make sense as to why the church would be opposed? Maybe help you think through a little bit more deeply as to you know how do we how do we think through and talk about it from a Catholic point of view? So we want it. We want to have great love towards people that struggle with same-sex attraction, but yet we, we don't, but we want to help them see what their true identity is as beloved uh, sons and daughters of God. Um, so that will lead us to transgenderism. So that's kind of the most current thing that's being pushed right now. Right? The denial of the integrity of body and soul is really what this one's all about.
right? But if you've broken things down as to who we are, the way God has made us from the very beginning, if you've broken down that, you know, that sex has any, you know, our physical bodies and, the, and our sexual bodies have anything to do with complementarity, that there's, there's really no need for that complementarity, well, then maybe the difference between men and women just doesn't exist at all. You know, if, if our bodies don't mean anything, <laughs> we just throw out all the differences, right? And so it, it really is, I mean, if you really think about it, at least in my mind, uh, the more I reflect on it, it's like it just it makes absolute sense that we went through this, this, this progression. You know, it logically leads. If we're going to go down that path, one leads to the next. Um, so it was in 2015 when same, same sex were given the right to marry. And so, I mean, since then, it's been, it's been uh, transgenderism quite, quite uh, pushed quite uh, vigorously. So let's talk about gender identity. And as I was looking back at my notes, I, I put together these a couple of years, ag years ago. So I don't have the most updated examples because like new example, new crazy examples could be brought like happen all the time, like every day. There's there's new ones that I could bring up, but um, so some of these are a couple of years old already. So sorry that I don't have time to update all my notes. But we could look at things like you know, high profile Bruce slash Caitlyn Jenner, um, who was an Olympic gold medal winning decathlete and personality, and then declared himself transgender in 2015. To do so, he ended a 23-year-long marriage, underwent cosmetic surgery, and would say things like, being a woman is a mental state and lifestyle. Ladies, would you agree with that? It's just a mental state and lifestyle? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Got a lot of mental, a lot of mental media attention and praise. Oh, one interview he said, he was asked, you know, what's the hardest thing about being a woman? He said, the hardest thing about being a woman is figuring out what to wear. <laughs> Yeah. He went to a college, the south of where I'm from, south ten fifteen or sixteen minutes away there. Oh, okay. Yeah. And um, it, he has a Bruce Jenner like activity center that's named after him. Yeah. And so the big joke was, well, they changed the name on it. So did they change the name on it? Um, I don't know exactly, but they weren't going to go to Caitlin. They weren't going to go that way. They weren't going to go that way. They might change it to something completely different. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. he donated a or, yeah donated a bunch of money to it. That's why, it, yeah, yeah. So um, other examples of high-profile ones. Um, this was in 2018. So this was 2020. So Ellen Page slash, slash Elliot Page. Um, she is a Canadian actress. She entered a same-sex marriage in 2018. Um, it, but then by 2020, she had declared herself to be transgender, went through top surgery, said, by age nine, I felt like I was a boy and I wanted to be a boy, and I asked my mom if I could be a boy someday. Right, so it's kind of interesting. So, so some of the background of like how do you get into this mentality? I mean, she she's I mean her background's atheist, um, pro-choice, feminist, you know all those kinds of things. But uh, so the interesting thing is is that she was in a same-sex marriage, but then she became transgender. So if you think about it. So the claim that is made is that these individuals were never actually what they previously were, right? So she never actually was a woman. So that means she never, she never actually had same-sex attraction. She never actually was in a same-sex marriage, but she was always a straight man. <laughs> yeah. And so that means her partner, who entered, engaged in a same-sex mar you know, marriage, never actually was same-sex attracted either. So what, what often happens is a total erasure of everything that's come before to take upon this new identity. But you can begin to see it's the same kind of thing where we're replacing our, the core of our identity with one thing that we are experiencing about ourselves at that moment, right? And in no way am I denying that individuals could potentially have some kind of experience. In fact, you know, we have names for this. I mean, the names have kind of changed over time, whether it's gender dysphoria or gender identity disorder. So it's really the strong feeling that they're not the gender that they physically appear to be and that their bodies biologically are. And so they have a discomfort with either their male or female body, and it's so intense that it interferes with their functioning in everyday life. Um, so they just can't function normally. It causes them distress, anxiety, depression, 
And we have found that those who struggle with that, there are higher rates of different other mental health conditions that they can experience as well. Um, but the kind of change from the identity disorder to dysphoria, dysphoria focuses on the something wrong in the feelings, right? Rather than something wrong with our thinking, right? So the feelings are what's wrong, but the thinking is correct, right? And so that's really the way that the treatment has changed now. So the goal is no longer to change how the person feels to match more with the truth about the identity. It's now the goal is to deal with just the distress that comes from the feelings, right? To affirm that, yes, indeed, this is who you are. And so now we're going to affirm your, so that we can, we're affirm you so that we can deal with the bad emotions. Um, so there's, there's, and, and once again, these are old ones. We could have many new ones. The, the pushes in society, especially in the areas of sports where now we have, you know, off, most of the time it's, it's, uh, men wanting to compete against women. Um, and, uh, but the problem is, is that, I mean, there's a reason why we have different sports for men and women, because men and women are not the same. Uh, they're not physically built the same, and so we have to. I mean, just do when I was at uh, when I was at Pope John. These were the these were the uh, the tr the the track records for the men and women. I mean, if you go through and you look at the records, so there's the hundred meter. Um, you compare the times there. Uh, men have better times, right, under the hundred meter. If you go to the two hundred meter, men have a better time under the two hundred meter. If you go all, through all of these records, and every single time, men have a better record than the women do, right? It's not because men are intrinsically better than women. It's because we're they're different, right? And that's why they need to. They, they, there's a biological difference there. Um, I'll give you an example for myself too. So when I was in track in high school, my best event was the 800 meter. I was I was okay. Um, I my time, in fact, was faster than the fastest girl in the state. <laughs> but competing against the guys who I'm supposed to be competing against, I didn't even qualify for state. <laughs> you know. Now, to be fair, the fast, the world record for women in the 800 meter, the fastest woman in the world, destroys my time completely. But compared to the fastest man in the world, it's not even close. So fastest woman is, so I ran a 207, fastest woman in the world, ran a 153, but the fastest man in the world ran a 140.9. <laughs> so it's like, it's not even close. They may sound close, but that's not, that's not even close at all. <laughs> so there are important differences. And so I've had to have like um, the Nebraska sports. Uh, how are we going to participate in sports in Nebraska? So they had a policy, and I haven't looked since then, so I don't know if they've changed things since 2016. Uh, but they set a had a set of policy in place by which transgender students would be evaluated to participate in sports of the opposite sex of their birth. And there had to be proof of hormonal supplementation and suppression therapy, and that was determined that that doesn't violate. right? So if they're suppressing their hormones, then, then, then that doesn't violate. Locker rooms and bathrooms, that's another issue that's going to be part of that as well as to how they should, you know, how do we, how does that work um, as well. So I won't get into all the details in here, but note that these are some of the cultural ramifications that happen with this push culturally to eliminate the, uh, the differences between men and women. Uh, we also had to, in 2021, deal with the uh, Nebraska Department of, of Education proposed health standards that were being pushed because there's a lot of uh, a lot of the weird sexual things that were, are going on in the culture are trying to be pushed onto education for our children, right? So here's just a few examples of things. Um, so even in kindergarten, right, discuss the different kinds of family structures in kindergarten, right? But they excluded from that traditional marriage, right? We should talk about all these other things, but we won't actually talk about, you know, having a mom and a dad. Um, we're going to talk about gender and gender identity as early as first grade, right? You know, so um, there was pushback on that, and so it basically got put on hold, but we have to really continue to be wary because who knows when they're going to start up. And back. Are they pushing? Yeah, yeah. They're, so I mean, it's, it's going to be coming soon. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I mean. Why are you 
yes, come to the Catholic school. Because <laughs> we're, we're not going to teach those things because their identity is as this beloved son or daughter of Jesus Christ. Their identity doesn't lie in whatever they feel like they may be. No. Uh, because they're, I mean, what they may feel like they may be may not be authentically an actual, the actual gender dysphoria. Now, as I said before, we don't deny that some people have authentic experiences gender dysphoria, but there can be people that begin to believe they have that based upon the influence of external influences around them. So um, in Australia, and I would say probably here in this country too, but this, there was these, those kind of studies were, were being first looked at in Australia, that they discovered that young people were trying out being transgender because it was popular, right? Everyone's talking about it, right? People who come out as being transgender are the popular ones, right? They're praised and glorified in the media and everything, right? Why They've got. They well, they claim that there are that. So, they claim it. so they just claim it, and then they start dressing differently, right, and pretend like they're, uh, oh, you know. Like they're not doing the hormones and all that, right? Well, they it's might be. Yes, out. actually, that often is what happens: is that once somebody says that they are, then the what's what is the treatment? affirmation whether it's counseling affirmation hormonal affirmation surgical affirmation right and so that's and and so they they take what a young person which if you think about it i mean young people are i mean do we know who we really are at that point in our life no. not really right we're, we're susceptible to every influence around us right and this this is especially true for girls they found that, that, that there is a huge increase in transgender claims with young girls. So there's a name for it, rapid onset gender dysphoria, right? Where suddenly, where it didn't exist before, suddenly now everybody is experiencing it. So if you, all you have to do is look at self-identification of the generations and see how it's, um, it just continues to skyrocket. Um, and if it were simply just biological based, we wouldn't expect that kind of change among the generations, especially now that it has become, to identify in this way has become accepted culturally, right? So you go from, you know, 0.3 and 0.2% in previous generations, jumps hugely up in millennials to 1.2 to 1.8, right? And it continues to climb. Um, so that, so this six to nine times greater percentage compared to previous, it can't be. It can't just be biological in account, um, but the this kind of cultural influence. So, um, let's look a little bit about. So, if we look at it from the point of view of faith, of what is being denied here is really one of the most fundamental truths, going all the way back to the beginning, and the way that God reveals to us who we are. That God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Right? That's what trans transgenderism attacks. It attacks this fundamental truth about who we are, that we're made in God's image and likeness. Right? So this is a rejection of God, a rejection of who, who, who we are being made in his image and likeness. And so we'll, we'll see. I'll bring up some quotes from Pope Benedict and from Pope Francis. And they talked about some of these things. We'll see how they reflected upon it. Because this is so new that the church doesn't have, she doesn't, she doesn't have like a huge document just on transgenderism at this point, like from the, from the Vatican yet. Um, because, I mean, like, even this is a couple of years old that I put this together, and there's so many more examples that I could bring in. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so... How would we see the origin of this? Well, somebody who's experiencing gender dysphoria, if it's a real case of gender dysphoria where they're confused about their identity, ultimately it goes back to every origin of every disordered thing in our life, which is original sin, right? So the pain and suffering that from the free choice of Adam to follow our own plan rather than God's plan, right? And so instead of choosing what's right, we often desire what's wrong, right? And so this is the same way is that for whether it's somebody who's experiencing same-sex attraction or or feel like they're in a, they're they're the wrong the 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 wrong sex or just any other kind of sin that we can experience that's what's going on we desire what's what isn't good we think it is good because nobody seeks out what's 
going to make you miserable. You only want what's going to make you happy, but you're, you're, you're just incorrect in your thinking, right? It's not, it doesn't, what you think doesn't match reality, right? So what you believe is a lie. It's not the truth. So let's hear what, so here's, this is from, uh, Pope Benedict. He wrote this in, uh, December of 2012, uh, while he was still Pope, uh, man and man and woman as created realities as the nature of the human being no longer exists. So he's describing, this is what transgender idea says, right? It claims that as created realities, there's no such thing as men and women anymore, right? They no longer exist. That's why, I mean, culturally you'll see, you know, maybe when people try to get people, or when some one side gets to, tries to get the other side to explain, you know, can you explain what men and women are? They can't, right? Because they don't exist anymore in that philosophy now. Man calls his nature into question, right? From now on, he is merely spirit and will. His physical body doesn't matter, right? Now he's just what he is in interiorly. If I think and feel I am this way, it doesn't matter what my physical body is, right? So it's a denial of, of human nature. So he continues, the manipulation of nature, which we deplore today where our environment is concerned, now becomes man fun man's fundamental choice where he himself is concerned. So here he's talking about, you know, oftentimes the people that are promoting ideas such as the gender ideology are also very strong uh, components of the environmentalist movement, right? That human beings can't do anything that would affect nature around us in a, in a unnatural way. But yet we can do that to ourselves. <laughs> so evidently we're not actually part of nature which is actually what many of them in the environmentalist movement believe is that we're actually like a, we're like a, uh, a parasite upon nature. We're not actually part of nature itself, uh, which the church would, if we have time, we'll, we, can, we can talk about the church's social teaching with regard to environmental stuff too. But um, we should care for nature, but we reject some of the ideas that the culture has in that area. So it's, this is all about manipulating who we are to, to form us into what we should be. Um, he continues, but if there's no preordained duality of man and woman in creation, then neither is the family any longer a reality established by creation. Likewise, the child has lost the place he had occupied hitherto and the dignity pertaining to him, right? So this is a destruction of the core of the family, right? As we've already seen with same-sex attraction too, it's a similar thing, right? You don't need a mother and father. Marriage is not about making sure a mom and dad are united to their children, now it's just about what adults want, right? Their own, their own self-service. And it's the same thing with this, right? Because the kinds of things that we see children being subjected to, they're really being an experiment. <laughs> you know, culturally, um, we're experimenting on children and seeing what happens, right? Because we don't know, I mean, the kind of treatment that's, we'll, 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 we'll look at some of that here in a little bit. But so he's pointing out that this undermines the reality of what the family is. The most dangerous snare of this current of thought is, in fact, the absolutation of man. Man wants to be absolutus, freed from every bond and every natural constitution. He claims to be independent and thinks that his happiness lies in his own self-affirmation. This is a radical denial of the nature of the creature and child in man, which ends in tragic loneliness. So what he's saying is that this, this doesn't solve... The, 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 the utter loneliness that people who feel like they don't belong anywhere, determining for yourself who you are, determining your own identity and you know calling yourself whatever the next new identity is that comes out, doesn't make you happy. And in fact, it makes you lonely. It separates you because you have to decide who you are, right? It's so freeing to find out that you're a child of God, right? That you don't have to come up with who you are. I don't have to. I don't have to make it up, you know. I may be completely confused, but now I now I know who I am, right? But in this case, you have to come up with who you are, and it can change all the time. I mean, for those who do that, oftentimes that's what happens, right? Right now, this is what I've defined myself as. Later, I've decided now I've defined myself as something different, right? They are absolutely alone because they have no one who has created them, right? They have to create themselves. They have no father in heaven of whom they are a child, right? And so he says, this is the most dangerous snare, right? Because this affects 
us spiritually. This is, this is the isolation of the enemy, right? The enemy desperately wants to isolate every single person from God. And that's what this does. In fact, I mean, that's, uh, Pope Francis will, will, will carry on this kind, these kinds of themes, right? So um, there's some of the uh, uh, interviews that he did where he said these. He said, then there is the mistake of the human mind, gender theory, creating so much confusion, confusion so the family is really under attack. Gender theory that doesn't recognize the order of creation, right? So you can, you can definitely tell the differences of the way these two popes speak. <laughs> Pope Benedict is a very, he's very, he, he, he's very well thought out and he's very much a theologian where Pope Francis speaks off the cuff, you know. <laughs> um, one of the things though, so like I mentioned that, you know, this, 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 the worst trap of this is to isolate us from God, right? From, to have to create ourselves, to isolate us. And that's why Pope Francis, in another place, he literally says, gender ideology is demonic, right? It is from the enemy who is trying to isolate us from God, right? And to get us to forget who we are. So um, we could look at science in great detail. I won't really, I'll kind of flash through this a bit. There's, there's probably more updated resources that I could use here as well. There's one report that uh, you can find going back to 2016 where they summarized over 200 peer-reviewed studies to look at the various aspects of, of sexuality and gender. And this looked at both things having to do with same-sex attraction as well as uh, gender ideology. So the d findings that they had on gender identity um, so the hypothesis that gender identity is an innate fixed property, independent of biological success, that you could have a person, you might have a man trapped in a woman's body or a woman trapped in a man's body, that there's no scientific evidence for that. <laughs> um, we would also say that that's not possible with regard to theology either, because you can't, sometimes a parent might say, well, it's like, well, God couldn't have made a mistake when they made my child, so therefore my child must be transgender. Well, it's like, well, you're simultaneously saying God can't make a mistake and he did make a mistake because you're basically saying someone who's transgender from our from theology point of view would be saying that God has placed the wrong soul in the wrong body, right? He has placed a female soul in a male body or a male soul in a female body, right? That's what you're basically saying if someone is transgender. But that's not possible. Every body and soul is designed specifically for the one that God has given to them, right? Um, so that's some, from, th from theological point of view. So yeah, it gives some estimate of some of the percentage there, which has gone up over time because of the newer generations. Um, they looked at, some studies looked at brain structure. Is there a brain difference, right? Is it wired into the brain between transgender and non-transgender? Um, it said some studies may have found a weak correlation between brain structure and cross-gender identification, but you can't prove the order of, of causation, right? Was it that these differences were there and that caused the transgenderism? Or was it the movement in transgenderism that led to the changing structures in the brain, right? There's no way to tell that, and so it's not proof that there is, that's an innate biological thing. Um, Compared to the general population, those who have done re sex reassignment surgery continue to have the higher risk of poor mental health, right? So some will, will claim that that solves, their, solves the issues, but it doesn't, right? They will often have a much greater um, of health issues, greater um, uh, probability of attempts for suicide. Um, children that, that express gen transgender um, identification um, there's only a very small number that will continue to experience that into adulthood, which if you're looking at it from just a purely, you know, caring for that child point of view is you don't want to do something that's permanent to them, right? Because m a majority of them are going to, in a sense, grow out of it in some way. Um, little scientific evidence that for the value of delaying puberty um, or modifying through surgery, their secondary sex characteristics. Um, so there's not evidence that that is support. Uh, and then there's more findings upon mental health. I'll kind of go over that. Um, the uh, current treatment policies, this is what's being promoted in the culture today, is not to change, I said earlier, how the person feels about the gender, but instead to deal with the distress 
right? And so therefore the psychotherapy and counseling is to affirm what they're experiencing, um, to bring about surface changes, changing their dress or their names or their behaviors and claiming that, that now they know what it is to be a woman or a man, you know, um, or to use, to use medicine like puberty blockers to, to suppress change the, to, to alter physical changes using hormones, uh, to develop traits that the other sex would identify with, or even going so far as to do surgery. Um, one of the things with regard to uh, a good resource, I won't play this, uh, this part again here, but uh, this is a really good, you can fi fi look up Patrick Lappert, who is a plastic surgeon and a Catholic deacon. And so as he's going, he, 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 he connects the reality that, well, the way, we, uh, the, the way that we can better understand um, gender dysphoria is in terms of, of I mean, it, it falls under a kind of obsessive compulsive disorder called body dysmorphic disorder with the way that one views one's body doesn't match with what's actually in reality. So, so like there's, there's all sorts of different kinds and obviously different people have different degrees of this. Um, but there's ones where like, for example, there might be certain body dysmorphic disorders where maybe the individual, you know, they look at their, they, their, their, their arm, you know, they don't think is their actual arm, right? And so they would like it removed, right? Well, a surgeon shouldn't do that. They shouldn't remove their arm because they feel like, I don't think this is my arm, right? But that's a real condition that some people have, right? But surgeons are told not to do that. Right, a similar kind of one that would fall under there. Uh, anorexia, ner anorexia nervosa, right? So someone's anorexic, right? So you've got a young woman who f has this, her perception of herself is being overweight, right? But she's thin as a rail in reality, right? A doctor who comes across this should not reaffirm, should not affirm her mental thought of herself, right? You're right. You are overweight. You're right. You you shouldn't eat, right? That will lead to her death, right? She will die. She will starve to death if we were to do that. What is the treatment that we do in that case? We try to change the perception of her that she has of herself to match with the reality. But when it comes to gender dysphoria, we've decided not to do that. We've decided now because it has to do with sex, and we all lose our mind in our world around us when we deal with that, <laughs> is now, in, now we're going to affirm. But if we did that with anorexia, we would kill them off, right? And that's precisely what we're doing to people today, is that we're destroying people's lives because we're not trying to change. We're we're trying to affirm their what their their false understand false perception of who they are, right? Instead of help them to change their perception to match with what's actually in reality, right? So, I think that's one of the most helpful analogies is you know thinking of in terms of you know anorexia or something like that because it's very clear in that case is like well this is what we should do <laughs> to help that person we don't affirm their false understanding of who they are so why do we do it in the area of sexuality it doesn't make any sense so where does it come from well it's likely pretty complex you know there's probably aspects to somebody who's struggling with gender dysphoria that are biological and psychological and social and even spiritual i mean we're a whole person you know, could could be related to er, trauma earlier in one's life that brought a lot of confusion in the area of sexuality to a person. Possibly doesn't always mean that you know there was abuse or something in the, that person's past. Could be because of the culture around them, right? That is suggesting. I mean, they see they're on TikTok all the time and they're watching all these different videos and people are saying this or they're you know, it's a teenager who's going through this period of time of, of not knowing who they are, trying to figure out who they are. And these influences around them are saying, oh, if you experience this, that means you're transgender. When in actuality, it's like, no, that's a normal thing that any teenager experiences. It has nothing to do with you being in the wrong body. Um, I mean, talking about some of those kinds of things, if we look at some of the science of child development, you know, there's claims today as to how early someone can be, you know, a child can be transgender, right? But in reality, before the age of three and four, you really don't have any, the child doesn't have a conception really of the difference between boys and girls. Um, you know, ages four to six, they really begin to recognize gendered behavior and that they're, they're different from one another. Uh, they're, gonna, they're going to explore um, 
Um, they're going to explore various various aspects, play pretend, explore different roles, um, which is normal. So just because a child, like you have a boy that starts playing with his sister's dolls doesn't mean he's transgender, right? Or the girl starts playing with a truck doesn't mean she's a boy. These, those are all stereotypes anyway, right? In, in the same breath, they can be like stereotype but also reject stereotype. I know. Um, yeah, it's just not a concrete idea. They're just trying to figure out what it means to who they are. Um, six to eight years old, they see gender as something stable. Eight to ten, they can now begin to think more abstractly about things. I mean, when you're younger, you can't even you can't abstractions like gender identity is not something you, they can comprehend yet at that point. Um, ten to twenty-four, all the way to twenty-four, and then they begin to understand who they are. Right? <laughs> you know. Who am I? Where do I belong? What am I supposed to do with my life? Right? You're still struggling even all the way up into there. Who am I? Right? Who 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 am I? Um, some people mature sooner than others, but you know. Um, so a lot of development also goes on during that time of adolescence. So with regard to gender dysphoria, one to three percent of youth struggle with it, right? Only six to twenty-three percent of that one to three percent will continue to experience it into adulthood. All right, so it's a very tiny percentage that's going to continue. So therefore, even if they have that confusion in childhood, it does not mean it's going to last into adulthood. So therefore, that means it is a terrible idea to do anything that makes that confusion permanent because the vast majority of them will not stay in it. But when our world today ha takes children and affirms them in that, they don't care about this fact. It's all about adults and wanting to affirm what adults feel about themselves by using children as an experiment to affirm what they want. All right. So what they think now isn't necessarily what they're going to grow up to be. But we get things like there was an HBO show called Transhood in 2020 that had four young people aged 15, 12, 7, and 4 that were claimed to be all be transgender. Right? And so they were showing how that they were being affirmed and growing up in that way, right? When this is the exact opposite of what, you know, child psychology and would, would, would say. Uh, also, won't go into this in too many details, but if you look at some of the origins of some of this treatment and where it came from and the individuals who did this, there's a lot of really gross stuff there. So you've got some individuals, uh, Kinsey, Benjamin, and Money, um, who are kind of pioneering these through the 50s through the 70s. Uh, Kinsey believed that everything, every sexual act was legitimate, was even including pedophilia was, was, was legitimate. Uh, Harry Benjamin was wor worked closely with Kinsey. Dr. John Money, um, he did a surgery on a two-year-old boy, David, so that the, the, the twins, so that to see, you know, if we did surgery and the parents raised one as a girl, one as a boy, how would that work? You know, what would happen? You know, of course, it was found out later that he was a pedophile and he had abused both of those children. And that, uh, unfortunately, what happened to, to both of the boys is, uh, well, the one who had been raised as a girl reversed the sex change by 14, but then they both committed suicide by 38 um, because they were. And so this is the origins of the transgender stuff that we have today. Um, the origins of surgery treatment was first done by Dr. John Money at Hopkins University, um, but they reported no positive results, and so they closed down the clinic. But these men still have the, the standards of care and the, the influence that from the beginnings of this are still utilized today. Um, so uh, also, if you're looking at you know, what the block, puberty blocker drugs are all about, to use to lower the levels of testosterone and estrogen. Um, the drugs are also used in other areas to like treat cancer. <laughs> um, and uh, so one of the drugs there, um, you can see the reporting of various reactions that can cause, those aren't all necessarily transgender cases, but those are in other cases in which that drug is also used. So um, we're giving those to children as well. Um, other victims, especially for those where they, you know, places where they are allowing the opposite sex to go into locker rooms and bathrooms, is those who 
are survivors of sexual trauma or could be potentially abused because we're not saying that those who experience gender dysphoria are automatically abusers, but that people who are abusers can, manip can utilize those laws to their advantage, right? Claim that I'm transgender so that I can get, I can get access to the ones that I want to abuse, right? And uh, so predators can take advantage of those things. Um, overall, finally, to, to kind of conclude, uh, when it comes to those who have gender dysphoria, who struggle with that, and so this is not the lobbying people, this is not those that are, but these are the real individuals who really do struggle with this, is that we, I mean, we want, we, we do love them, right? They belong in the church too, you know, but we have to, we, we want to walk with them, listen to what's going on in their life, but to help them so that their perception of who they are changes to match with reality, right? And ultimately help them to see that you're more than just what you're experiencing right now with regard to sexuality or the confusion as to who am I, but that you're a beloved child of God, right? That is your fundamental uh, identity, right? Um, which is a challenge today because we're, there's many cultural forces that want to just force us to, you got to affirm, affirm, affirm. And it's like, well, that's not a good idea in a lot of other things that our children bring up. <laughs> you, know, you know, there's many times in which we have to say, well, that's nice, but no. <laughs> you know, you will wear a coat outside. No, you are going to eat some vegetables. You're not just going to eat your, before you eat dessert, you know. <laughs> You're going to act like a little boy or girl, not a puppy dog. No, <laughs> you know. Um, so once again, you know, to counter some of this with the theology of the body, even for a younger, you begin with, you know, the differences. You know, God has, you know, there are differences be between boys and girls, and and how we speak, and 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 you know, these are these are these are foundational before you ever get to the area of sexuality. Um, so, um, so hopefully, we can see. You know, as the culture continues down this path, the church remains firm in always in affirming the way God has created us from the very beginning, right? And so in all these cases, going back to, you know, the original vision before the fall, before, you know, we got all crumpled up, <laughs> but we've seen that original vision, we can see how Jesus comes to heal us. And ultimately, you know, as messed up as our world around us can be, we have great hope in that Jesus, the, the, the truth is stronger than any, any of the lies that the enemy brings, right? It doesn't mean that he can't destroy many people, but um, that Jesus Christ can, and, but we have to be, we have to be his, uh, we have to be the means through which he, he brings his truth to those that we meet uh, in those areas, so.